The Calliope Raid by Charles L. Dyke in the story of Sioux County. On the morning of January 22, 1872, Sioux County was under two or three feet of snow on the level, and the weather was cold. But before dawn of that day, the flickering light of kerosene lanterns could be seen here and there on the snowy expanse as the settlers emerged from their dugouts and shanties to feed their horses or mules, preparatory to the long drive to the extreme west of the county to assert their rights of citizenship as the state of Iowa and the United States. Settlers from northeastern and northern parts of the county had come to Orange City the evening before and stayed overnight at the Widow Mao, who ran a tavern, as well as in an Orange City schoolhouse where bunks were hastily improvised. At the appointed time, all met at the schoolhouse were Hriche Mao, now Mrs. Marinus Rauenhorst, and assistants, made coffee in a wash boiler, and served it with bread and meat to the cold and hungry adventurers. Soon the cry was heard, Get ready, boys, on to Calliope and westward the long line of about 55 sleighs led by the intrepid Hendrik Jan van der Waal and his famous mules wended its way. The sky, which was overcast before dawn, cleared up, and at the time of starting it was bitterly cold, the air filled with snow crystals that sparkled like diamonds, a sun dog scintillating brilliantly on each side of the sun. The thermometer registered 22 below zero. The road was a mere trail and on top of packed snow. There were no passing places, and fortunately they met no sleighs going in the opposite direction. It was almost impossible to wallow through the deep snow. The sleighs were partly filled with prairie hay for warmth, and the settlers were dressed as warmly as possible, but most of them had no fur coats. As overshoes were not yet the vogue with the settlers, they almost all wore wooden shoes, which are warmer than other shoes of any kind, and which kept their feet from freezing. The despised wooden shoe helped win the fight and bring the courthouse, or at least the safe, to Orange City. Another party of enforcers of representative government gathered in the Rock Valley Hall territory. They were timed to meet the men from Orange City, where the Rock Valley Trail met the Orange City Calliope Trail, and they were timed almost up to the minute. The eastern and northeastern men were at the intersection, but a minute before the Rock Valley Hull section of 25 sleighs appeared over the hill, and a mighty cheer arose from both sections in welcome. After the leaders exchanged a few words, it was arranged that the east-northeast section should lead and the north section fall in behind them. And with a great shout, on to Calliope, it was forward again. The people of eastern Sioux County had engaged Judge Pendleton of Sioux City to assist Henry Hospers in the legal side of the undertaking, and Henry Hospers, A.J. Benton, and Pell Mulder, and the judge had gone to Calliope the day before and tried to settle the affair in a peaceable manner, but nothing came of it. As they had to stay overnight in Calliope, they did not say much about the intended raid, and while the Calliopers had heard about it by the Grapevine Telegraph, they did not take it seriously. In their opinion, the wooden shoe Dutch did not count for much. At that time, Ellen Vermeer, who later became Mrs. Jacob Muhlenberg, worked in the Calliope Tavern, where Auditor Root boarded and roomed. She said that before the raid, Root would not go to bed but walk the floor all night, presumably thinking up schemes of how to avert the coming disaster of losing his office. His son-in-law was a low German, and she wanted the Orange City people not to say anything in front of him that they did not want anyone to know. So the other Calliopers may have been whistling to keep up the courage. At about 10 o'clock in the forenoon, the first string of sleighs went over the top of the hill and descended into the valley of the Big Sioux, where lay the little town of Calliope, consisting of 12 homes and uh, 110 people. Of these houses, one was the Sioux County Courthouse, built of logs, with a frame lean-to which contained the safe, a school, a tavern, and a store. 
Across the Big Sioux River, about three miles south of where is now Hudson, was the town of Eden, South Dakota, which, when the railroad came, was moved to Hudson. At that moment, the Honorable, or rather Dishonorable, Board of Supervisors of Sioux County was in session. When the first sleigh drove into view, it was hoped to be a settler who had come to trade in the Little Burg or to transact business at the courthouse. But when a second sleigh and a third and a fourth, until there seemed to be no end of them, came down the hill, consternation seized the little group of legislators, and Chairman Eli Johnson hastily made a move to adjourn, which was seconded and acclaimed by all except Henry Hospers. During the trip from Orange City, it was somewhat squally, and occasionally the sun was obscured. But just as the procession descended into the valley of the Big Sioux, the sun burst forth in all its glory, and the ice particles glittered like diamonds, and the sun dogs were again a blaze of color. Nature fittingly set the stage in snow, a blue sky, sunlight, and color, when the wooden shoe actors and others did the most daring act ever done in the county. As they went down the hill, they became somewhat excited and sped up their teams, and almost before the Calliopers were aware of it, about a hundred sleighs filled with determined American citizens were among them. When the cavalcade came to a standstill, the leaders were accosted by Sheriff Tom Dunham and his deputies, who demanded to know the reason for the raid. He was told that they came to see to it that their duly elected officers were installed. If this was done, there would be no trouble. But if not, they would take the matter in their own hands and take the county records and the seal and the safe back with them to Orange City. At this impromptu address, the sheriff assumed a swaggering attitude and with an impressive shake of the head told the men that he was ready to quell all disorder and what they proposed would only be accomplished by stepping over his dead body, or words to that effect. But the raiders were not to be scared so easily, and they told him that they intended to do just what they had outlined, and that if he would resist, they would either tie him up, or his dead body, he spoke of, would not need burying, as it would be plugged so full of lead that it would sink like a rock through the fishing hole in the ice of the Big Sioux River. The sheriff saw that there were several ex-soldiers present who had gone through the fierce battles of the Civil and Indian Wars and were not afraid of a little bloodletting, and that they were backed up by a large number of hot-blooded young fellows, all armed with guns and revolvers. The sheriff sensed that resistance was useless and judged that discretion was the better part of valor, so the sheriff and his deputies were then dismissed and told to go to the sheriff's home, and a watch was placed over the house as well as over the other houses. His sensible action was appreciated by the raiders, and he was re-elected when his term expired. Tomorrow, the confrontation begins. <laughs>